My name is Dr Guy Gratton. I'm an Associate Professor of Aviation and the Environment at Cranfield University in Bedfordshire. Um, I work across um, aeronautical engineering and environmental science and in particular I've been working recently with the light aircraft company here at Little Snoring in Norfolk on a project called Enabel, Enabling Aircraft Electrification, which has included developing and test flying uh, this aircraft, the Sherwood E-Cub, which has been Britain's first designed and built all-electric conventional aeroplane. The Sherwood E-Cub is part of a broader project called Enabel, which is run by a consortium of four organisations, Cranfield University, the Light Aircraft Company, Flylight Air Sports and CDO Squared. This was the first aeroplane to be built, the Sherwood E-Cub, which is now 17 flights into its flight test programme. The second aircraft is getting close to its first powertrain ground testing and then flight testing, which is the electric Sky Ranger Ninja. Uh, based with uh, Flight Light's um, factory at um, Sywell in Northamptonshire. And the whole objective has been to learn the fundamental lessons of how to build, to fly, to test and to certify an electric aeroplane. And it's been a British-centred project, so it's been very much about creating British intellectual property that can lead to, ultimately, British aircraft and British jobs building them. So we now have a good idea of what the performance of the Sherwood E-Cub will be. It's best defined in terms of the altitude it can climb to and the range it can fly. So if we climb to around 1,000 feet, the aeroplane's capable of flying probably for about an hour and a quarter at about uh, 45 knots. So that's going to give you round about 60 nautical miles, about 70 statute miles plus another 30% safety reserves on top of that. If we climb up to 2,000 feet, that's going to come down to around about an hour, so about 45 nautical miles. If we want to really go for altitude, the aeroplane will probably climb to around about 7,000 feet. We haven't tried quite that high yet. We have been up to six. Um, and by the time you've reached 7,000 feet is probably the point where you need to think about turning right round and going back and landing where you took off from. So the test flying of the aeroplane so far has concentrated on the basic system integrity. So we've now got to the point where everything works, it all works together, the aircraft performance is acceptable, the safety of the aeroplane is established. It is probably at a point now where an ordinary PPL could get in and fly this. The next stage of the flight test program is performance based. So we're learning to create the performance manual for an all-electric aeroplane in terms of climb performance, cruise performance, takeoff and landing distances as a function of battery charge, air temperature and so on in ways that haven't been done before. We know how to do this for a conventional aeroplane but we don't at the moment know how to do this for an electric aircraft so we're learning how to do that. Um, that will also involve testing of failed components um, so failure of the selectable throttle backstop, so going to zero power and increasing power again and seeing how it behaves. Failing a single battery pack, possibly we may go as far as failing two battery packs and seeing how the aircraft's performance maps and how to teach pilots to safely operate the aeroplanes. So that's the next stage. The following stage after that we're going to be putting more instrumentation in the aeroplane and we're going to be doing a bit more of a pure research related to how to instrument up an electric aircraft and how to measure things and if we get the funding for the next stage after that which is a program called Egypsy to develop a British 65 to 100 watt kilowatt electric powertrain the E-Cub is going to be used as the test bed for the cockpit instruments for that which will then go into a larger aeroplane. The electric powertrain on the Cub here behind me, actually it's fairly low powered compared to what we can currently do with an internal combustion engine. So it's 28 kilowatts, which is equivalent to round about 40 horsepower. The Hearth F23 we've got in the next hangar in um, a similar aircraft is a little over 50 horsepower. So unsurprisingly, we get a poorer climb rate. Overall, we're averaging around a 360 foot a minute climb rate 
out of the Cub, whereas the Hearth engined aircraft is giving us initially around about 700, although the drop off with altitude is less with the electric engine than it is with the conventional engine, because of course it's not breathing air and therefore it's not affected by air density as much, although it is partly affected because it's still got a propeller. Yes, there is some redundancy. There's five battery packs and the aeroplane will fly on three. We've got a second throttle control and some of the wiring is duplicated. A lot of that was mainly because we wanted to do these things to learn from. So as we go through in the flight test program, for example, I'm going to be deliberately shutting down a single power pack at least to learn how to fly with reduced power, what the implications are for the operator's manual and performance data and so on. As we go forward, I think you can expect future electric aircraft to have more routinely duplicated uh, wiring, possibly duplicated controls. Um, they will certainly continue with this approach of duplicated battery packs. The analysis we've done suggests the perfect number of battery packs is probably three. This aircraft's got five because that was the size of batteries we were able to use at the time. The um, electric Skyranger Ninja that's coming after this, that will use four. Um, that number being a compromise between the ideal three and our weight and balance requirements. So what am I thinking about when I'm flying this compared to a normal engine? With a normal engine, of course, I've got fuel controls, mixture controls, carburetor icing to worry about. None of that is an issue on the electric powertrain. In the early days of testing of this aircraft, we did worry a lot about cooling. That's now solved. If you look at the latest version on the nose, you can see a really big air intake, and that's all for cooling the motor. So this has really taken it to the point where mostly it's um, very much carefree handling. I just more power, less power, occasional glance to make sure the temperatures are fine, but they always are now. Only significant point we have to consider that's new um, compared to a conventional engine is that on a conventional engine, if I close the throttle completely, I've still got some fuel going in, I've still got some power, um, and the propeller is still going round. Whereas if you close the throttle on this electric powertrain, the propeller stops, I've got no power into the motors whatsoever. And to then get it going again needs a trickle of power for a few seconds. That um, is new and that worried us quite a lot with regard particularly to the go around. So if I've got, um, if I were to fly an approach with zero power and then I suddenly needed to do a go around, I need that power straight away. So what we've done here is we've introduced something we call the Selectable Throttle Backstop or STB, very similar to what on a turboprop would be a flight idle stop. And what that is, is I select it before takeoff. And then that ensures that I can't get zero power. It comes back, the current setting is at about 300 watts. And that's just enough to keep the propeller continuously rotating so that when I need full power, I've got it almost straight away. Um, an additional benefit from a ground safety viewpoint is although it's relatively slow, the propeller is always going round, so it's much more obvious to anybody around the aircraft that I've got a live system and therefore they don't want to come anywhere near the propeller. What's the effect of the electric powertrain on noise in the cabin compared to a normal engine? It's less, but it's not enormously less than we're used to. Um, if you take a normal aeroplane, the piston engine and a propeller, about 20% of the noise comes from the engine and about 80% comes from the propeller. With this powertrain, the motor is almost silent, but the propeller is still a propeller. And that's true whether you're talking about uh, noise as heard from the ground or noise as heard in the cockpit. We've probably got about a 20% reduction in how loud it is because we've lost the engine noise, but we've still got the propeller noise and that's still transmitting itself through into the cockpit as well. So I'm sat here in the cockpit of the E-Cub, so let's have a little look at what the controls are and do. So this is obviously the control column, exactly the same as any other aeroplane. 
Uh, these two are the main wheel brakes for the left and right main wheels, so I can use those to supplement a turn um, as well as just braking straight. Down here is the throttle. Um, this works normally just like a normal aircraft throttle, although inside here is actually a potentiometer. This we call the STB or selectable throttle backstop and is equivalent to a, a flight idle stop on a turboprop engine. So with that selected, I can't quite stop the propeller, whereas if I flip it up, I can stop the propeller, which I aim to never do in the air, only on the ground. This down here is a normal um, pitch trimmer. If you uh, look here at the instrument panel, we'll talk about what the, um, cop the uh, flight and engine instruments do. These two are absolutely standard aircraft instruments, um, an altimeter and an airspeed indicator. Then over here, this is um, an AV-30 combined flight instrument. So it's an artificial horizon. I've got a duplicate airspeed indicator here. I've got a duplicate altimeter here. So they're duplicating what's going on here. Also a slip ball, which duplicates the mechanical one down here and I've got the ability to set barometric pressure. I've got a voltage indicator for the power system and critically I've also got a direction gyro here that allows, basically allows me to know which way the aircraft is flying because we've learned that it's really hard to get a normal magnetic compass to work with the electrical system in front of here creating a magnetic field. So we had two choices, either go for something that's basically a gyro and GPS solution or put a remote sending compass with a sender probably in the tail or on a wingtip and we decided this was our preferred way of working. That's the flight instruments. Now let's have a look at the um, powertrain. So this is a battery control unit. <coughs> Um, the system is not functioning at the moment, which is why you've got lots of red flashing lights, but I've got five banks here um, for the five battery packs. And each one of those, so I've got numbers one and two are in my port wing, number three is in the nose, numbers four and five are in the starboard wing. And I can turn it all on together simply by pressing that button for two seconds and releasing it, um, obviously with that guarded switch on. This right hand bank at the moment does nothing, but as we go forward in the flight testing, what I'm going to be doing is um, having one of those battery packs connected to the right hand array so we can turn that off and go from five to four battery packs as a way in flight test of simulating a battery pack failure. Um, this button down here is called the E stop. It doesn't affect the um, the primary controls, but if we push that, what happens is that a switch tells the inverter in the nose to stop providing power to the motor. So if I've got anything goes wrong um, and I'm worried about the power going into the propeller, I can hit this straight away and that will um, automatically stop the propeller, but I only need to rotate it um, and then close and reopen the throttle and I've automatically got power back into the motor again much faster than if I go into a software reset um, on the systems here. We also use this as a ground safety device um, because with that pressed the propeller can't go round and therefore um, when we're doing anything on the ground with the power on including charging the, mo the batteries up having that in is a safety measure that ensures that um, somebody can't accidentally set the propeller rotating and possibly injure someone outside the aeroplane. So on the right here, this is the Geiger ADI unit. This is how, when we're flying the aircraft, we monitor what the powertrain is up to. So um, some simple numbers up here, a nominal range on the current charge and what time it is. Then this shown 90 on a scale of 0 to 100, so that's my percentage state of charge. Um, it's a bit like how much fuel I've got in, which is also as an absolute value 288 amp hours. Batteries are at 57 volts, which is where they should be when it's um, uh, around approaching fully charged. Um, I've got temperatures for the battery. Here's 19 Celsius. 
motor is 11 Celsius, motor controller is at 12. Um, power here is showing it's, it's toggling around about 700-800 watts and you notice there's no sign so that means the battery is actually at the moment they're on charge on the ground. When we're flying I will see a minus sign because it's discharging the batteries and typical numbers I'm looking at around about minus 300, minus 400 when the throttle's closed. When I'm taxiing, depending on the slope and surface, between about 600 watts and 2000 watts. Takeoff power is going to be around about 25 to 29,000 watts. And in flight, I'm usually um, somewhere between about 10 and 15, depending on the conditions I'm, I'm flying at. Um, there's various touchscreen aspects here that also allow me to go in and look at individual systems if I need to. But for most purposes, I just use this basic screen. And then to the right of that, it's not fitted at the moment. We've got a bracket here that will normally carry our radio. And then the cables here uh, connect to an antenna that's at the back of the aircraft to keep it away from all the powertrain electrics and um, free of interference. So that is um, the cockpit of the Sherwood E-Cub. So what have we learned through this project? Um, huge amounts because we'd never built a, an electric aeroplane like this before. So we've learned a lot about how to integrate the motor, the controller into the um, aeroplane. We've learned how to design the cockpit controls. We've learned some small things about how to lay out the cockpit. Um, about where to put the cabling for the radio antenna to make quite sure that it's not being interfered with by the motor. We've learned it's incredibly hard to get a compass to work and in the end we gave up and replaced it with a uh, GPS based uh, direction indicator. Um, so and probably the single biggest and most important thing is all the lessons we've learned about what the safety standards need to be. So we've created a huge amount of work on electric aircraft safety standards which has been developed with the British Microlight Association and with the Civil Aviation Authority and more recently with the Light Aircraft Association and um, that work which we will be putting in the public domain sometime soon um, is going to be really critical for the whole future of electric flight because we've been working to define what the safety standards need to be for an electric aircraft. And of course this is fundamental to why we've done this aeroplane because this is not, yes, I believe this aircraft is going to be available to people who want to buy one, but it's also very much a learning platform to allow the big team to um, develop our understanding of how to deliver a safe and effective electric aircraft.